Thank you for this really rich and thought-provoking paper. So we've got some time for, uh, for questions. Shall I take the questions? Yes, Please. sure. <coughs> Thank you for a, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I just want to come to uh, come to the question of heterogeneity of ball being conceptualizing this relationship between nature and human. So, um, is there a variation within Hindu cosmology on the way in which this relationship is looked at? And also the difference between Hindu cosmology and say Adivasi worldview, etc. The difference between say, Hin say Indo-Islamic cosmology or Indo-Christian cosmology. So, so that this whole hybrid uh, sort of religious understanding and cosmology. Um, and second, I also wanted to come to this idea of accessing a nature and the relationship of nature through sort of Sanskritic uh, textual Puranic study, right? Because as all of us know that there are these sort of textual Sanskritic traditions accessible through pundits, but there are also these little folk traditions, little traditions, you know, traditions owned by say bhakti movements, vulnerable groups, and they may have a completely different way of conceptualizing. So I wanted to know if there are sort of a, um, how do we take into account the diversity of um, of of just worldviews of conceptualizing these relationships. And second, your your claim, and I think it's a very provocative claim and a wonderful claim about you know the, uh, that you may sort of worship nature, but at the same time it doesn't fall into the environment concerns. Now, I would think that if we were to look at Adivasi worldviews, and there are multiple worldviews, I think the reverse is true. I think um, some of your claims about you know the, the temporality of it, right, is, is challengeable, and certainly this idea that some amount of land should be Sort of available for consumption would completely not fall into Adivasi worldview. A lot of social movements have used that claim to, in fact, further environmental concerns. So I'm just wondering whether, uh, whether you know, how do we look at the converse? Okay. So uh, I'll take one by one. Yeah. So uh, heterogeneity of views, yes, I have just presented one view. Uh, the important thing for us to here realize is these are the only textures, tra traditions, and sources we have. And they're being dominant. Uh, they may not be the only worldview, but they have definitely been dominant worldviews. To a large extent, what also happens is due to what I mentioned was and others called sanskritization, a lot of local local narratives get buried into the larger narratives of Hindu thought. So uh, there is a heterogeneity of views. And uh, in my book, I've tried looking at other sources like literature. In fact, the South Indian view of nature and poetry is very different. Uh, uh, nature, concept of nature, and Ayurvedic thought, topocentric views, uh, Jaina geography. There are lots of other views which are uh, which uh, which can be talked about, and it comes to the relation between human and non-human. In fact, the Jaina thought is a very alternate dominant paradigm, which uh, which uh, goes against uh, the Hindu paradigm of uh, placing the worldview. And uh, we do have the difficulty of the textual tradition because they are in Sanskrit and they are. But to a large extent, we should learn to read between the lines. Many of them don't talk about nature the way I have talked about. You have to learn to read between and read critically between the lines. And then you probably extract. Yes, the Adivasi worldviews, for instance, um, are very localized. And uh, what happens with environmental concern is at a very local level, they work. But what is happening is the Adivasi uh, person, the person, the first peoples, uh, Adivasis are the first peoples, the first peoples of India themselves are in a state of transition and migration mm -hmm. into modernity. And there is no way, uh, when we work with the Nyamgiri Hills people, uh, it, it is very difficult for us, it's easier for us to convince the older people who kept the traditions alive, uh, who are more in touch with uh, how nature can be um, how they interact with nature and how they receive and give in return. Then the younger people, uh, most of the younger people wanted a cell phone. They wanted to no longer be hunter gatherers. They wanted to look for jobs. They were wanting computers. Most of them wanted mobile phones. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 it is a, it's a changing view. And in the midst of this, uh, what we can look for is probably not direct presuppositions, but look for ethical stances. I think that is where, even within the Hindu thought, though I've concluded mine on a critical note, we should look for places where ethical restraint is more important than the idea of the sacred. For instance, yoga. 
the amount of influence that yoga has had on the environmental movement is very, very great. A large number of people uh, who, who, for instance, the people of the yoga ashrams, for instance, uh, the people who teach yoga, when they go out and say, yogis should not cut trees, I have a large number of people who are doing yoga actually actively participate in you know, tree-hugging movement, for instance. So in a very strange way, ethical restraint, um, not having greed, Gandhiji's words, Krishnamurti's words, these seem to work, ethical movements seem to work better than invoking sacred metaphysical categories like sacred landscape. So in my, in my, um, in my paper on the lake, uh, I claim that it is uh, oral narratives as heritage is good, but oral narratives with heritage along with ethical restraint. So uh, telling people that you should bathe before you dip into the Ganges is a good way of, uh, in fact, all along the ashrams, that is the rule. You wash your feet in the tap, and then you step into the Ganges because you have to be pure to step into the Ganges. So some kind of ethical restraint, a very normative ethical restraint works better. And uh, 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 there are other diversity of views which, uh, which the Northeastern people have, which I haven't studied. And right now my work in the Himalayas is probably looking at one and only success story of sacred grove conservation of, by a direct god. He's called Eri Devta. And his sacred groves are sacred. And even today, in, in midst of all the pressures of modernity, uh, the god is a juridical god. He's pretty angry god. So they don't still cut his uh, trees down. And I found some old forest grove there. And that, I'm studying them and seeing whether that kind of a juridical god there are these juridical gods even in the south. They're called uh, the snakes, for example. The snake gods are all juridical. They're very, very territorial and uh, they're very localized. So perhaps uh, encouraging cultural ceremonies or modern cultural ceremonies around these uh, juridical, uh, territorial, local gods would help local conservation. But I don't see a universalization. It's very hard. It's a tough uh, choice to make. But and asked you a question. So, considering that the sacred landscapes are more towards the positive aspect, where would the negative aspect of the sacred landscape be? Um, so, the, 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 the sacred landscapes are positive in the sense that the oral histories are rich, the origin is rich, there is a respect, natural respect for the landscape. So people are fiercely protective of the landscape. But they're not completely protective. Um, what, what, what also happens in the sacred landscape, which is another part of my talk, which I didn't talk about, is there's also a desacralization that takes place because the material gets separated from the deity aspect. So you have the river Ganges there, which is water. And water gets separated and the goddess becomes a, a, a statue in a temple. So you are worshipping the statue in the temple, but you're not bothering about the materiality of the goddess as water. So she gets separated from a body. So there's a body and there is a spirit. The spirit gets worshipped separately. And the body can go wherever, wherever. So the po negative aspect is the, is the immutability of the sacred, that nothing can happen to it. The positive aspect is the natural respect and oral history that we can rely on sometimes. But according to my work, it's not working at all. I mean, practically, it's not working. We can, we can romanticize about it, but it doesn't seem to work on the ground. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the problem with Ganga that we're having today. Right? Yeah, a few months ago, I saw a TV ad that, that, uh, with a name, uh, the name of narrative was um, Mother Ganga is dying. <laughs> but it, it was kind of, it was shocking, because you, you don't hear a phrase like that very often. What was the phrase? Mother Ganga is dying. Mother okay. Ganga is dying, yeah. And it was evoking, you know, the, the feminine, I mean, protect your mother, Puti, uh, but you don't think of goddesses as dying. Dying, uh, yeah. It didn't last very long, so maybe it wasn't very effective. It wasn't effective. very effective. It's because people know Mother Ganga is very strong. <laughs> she can, she can bash through your defenses, so she destroys evil, so most goddesses. The, the whole point is that the whole feminine nature thing um, 
is surrounded inside the larger patriarchal Hindu religion, it becomes a lot of problem and it's fraught with a lot of difficulties. So people didn't buy it, they didn't buy it. They didn't buy it. Yes? Do you think this also has to do with the role that the wilderness plays in sort of a dialectic between uh, nature and civilization enacted in like ancient Hindu epics because I, I know whenever the characters do something bad or offend the gods in some way. They're often exiled to like nature where they, they learn some stuff and then crudely speaking they return to culture once they've achieved some form of enlightenment. Like our Arjuna is constantly learning things in the forest. So right from the beginning of the Hindu tradition, uh, there seems to be a tension bet between the rural indigenous traditions and sort of the the Vedic higher philosophy. Uh, that's true. Uh, we have the category of the Aranya or the forest versus the Gramya or the civilized area and there has been always a tension. Uh, the Aranya basically belong to the indigenous people and the Gramya or the settlers, um, the, the settled Pasha people and then the agriculturists, they move on to, uh, there is a tension. Uh, but in this case, uh, there are two, two aspects to this. So the first case is the idea of wilderness uh, is, there are a lot of interspaces. It is not a pure uh, binary because inside the forest is the ashram, the, the habitation inside the forest and inside the city or inside the gramya is the upavana or the enclosed forest. So, um, orgies take place inside city forests. In all literature, you'll have the hero heroine meet up inside these gardens where rules don't apply. And in the forest, in the ashram, there are often descriptions of a kind of a ecotopia where birds and animals live together. Shakuntala is a, a, a daughter of such a utopia. Right, and I should have realized that because one of the aesthetic traits of yogis is their ability to like tame nature, tame right? Nature, they yeah. often domesticate animals. I see. So it's not uh, like the typical Straussian binary between 